we've passed on all we know. A thousand generations live in you now. But this is your fight. What's up? Welcome to a special episode of Movie Schmovie. This is episode number 244. And I'm Steve. I'm John. I'm Ron. And through the magic of a phone call, we have come together to do a special episode of Movie Schmovie. We're going to be talking about Star Wars Rise of Skywalker, episode 9, the most recent and final episode of the Skywalker saga, I guess. I mean, I'm sure it is, but maybe not. Who knows? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, th- they have a another Star Wars film scheduled for Christmas of uh, 2022. Right. So that's right. three years from now, and they haven't announced what that project is. So reasonably, we should expect that to be uh, some new territory or some direction that we haven't seen before. So yes, this whole thing about it being the final movie, I think it, they were always careful to say of the Skywalker story, because they've even said that the new characters introduced in the sequel trilogy, uh, Ray, Finn, and Poe, could possibly spin out into future movies or TV shows or whatever they might do. They've got Disney Plus right now. Right. So it's not like there won't be Star Wars on the on the landscape. But it, it is interesting that right now we're about to see a break, of at least for three years in terms of the, the movies. I think we need it. Yeah, well, this was the end of something. And I think this was kind of the, the era of movies that brought Star Wars back um, and made it into this kind of modern franchise that might be seen as never ending. But, you know, maybe taking a break is a way of saying, well, it doesn't have to be constantly running. You can make people want it again. Yeah, I think I think we've kind of run into this fatigue of sequels, fatigue of things like that. And I think that a healthy break We'll build some anticipation when the next trilogy comes around. Well, that was one thing I wanted to ask you guys just at the top of this conversation, which was, how do you feel about Star Wars now compared to, uh, you know, 2015 when um, it was about to come back, when The Force Awakens was about to come out and we were all sort of excited about uh, just what it could be now that we have seen, what is that, five movies? Yeah. Um, is Star Wars less special than it was? Do you do you dig it? I mean, you know, where are you with Star Wars now? Now that we've seen the end of this trilogy, and the end of this kind of current phase of whatever they planned when when Disney bought Lucasfilm. In general, I I, I do kind of feel like this whole week leading up to seeing this movie, um, you know, this past Wednesday uh, or Thursday, whatever it was, I I I did feel like there there felt like there was like a palpable. Like I could feel it in the air of like a change in the way that Star Wars was just embraced or felt or talked about, at least in the, a lot of the things that I'm exposed to, uh, like on a daily, weekly basis, you know, whether it's at work or among friends or the social presence that I have online. It just felt like, you know, um, like whatever your feelings were about The Force Awakens or Last Jedi or any of the, you know, the Star Wars stories that have come out over the past few years, it does feel, at least in my gauge, that like something just feels off. And um, going into episode nine, I don't, I don't feel like there was as much of, of of a fanfare or of a just like just like that group feeling of like everybody was talking about, for example, Endgame this year, same year, and what Marvel did with that. And kind of how that concluded that arc of stories that they've been telling over the past 10 years. But oddly enough, I mean, we'll get into our, our personal feelings about the movie. Um, it's it's a, it's kind of weird because I feel like, you know, at the end of this trilogy, I, I sort of feel like it seems similar to kind of sort of how the prequel trilogy came and went in, in terms of there being a lot of criticism of it, those who loved it, those who embraced it, those who were disappointed by it. I mean, you're never going to satisfy everybody, but I mean, for what felt like a really strong start to this new trilogy, it does feel like there was some sort of, you know, missed, uh, missed engagement or missed opportunity with at least the reception of this trilogy. And if you look at the box office of each film, over the past four years, like that kind of speaks to a certain thing. And just, yeah, just something feels a bit diminished to me. Um, which again, like if I go back to, you know, the early two thousands, like, you know, when, when 
the last prequel film came out, it's like it kind of sort of felt the same way, even though many people feel like that that film kind of took that elite that set of tr- trilogy out on a higher note. Like it's one, it's probably the best of those three films. Where um, I don't know how people feel about this one, but it doesn't seem like it kind of went up from film to film. It became more divisive from film to film. It felt like, which is probably a part of like the internet culture that it's a part of now, and you probably can't avoid that, but. It does feel a little bit diminished to me, at least. Everything you've just talked about is almost separate from how you might feel about watching one of these new movies. Right, right. But I do think that The Rise of Skywalker is like a, a, a movie that's getting an unusual amount of scrutiny and criticism, not just because of the quality of what it is, but maybe because of what it represents. And maybe it is the apex of this, whatever we want to call it, this kind of toxic fandom or this kind of division in the fandom where there's just so much riding on it and so many people expect it to be so many things that um, following up a movie that a lot of people liked, but a lot of people hated like The Last Jedi and kind of maybe trying to pick up the thread from a movie like The Force Awakens that a lot of people love, but that a lot of people hated. It was an interesting challenge for uh, J.J. Abrams and his co-screenwriter, Chris Terrio, yeah. to try to wrap this up in a way that was going to please anybody, you know? And, and, and maybe uh, maybe the movie did some things to try to please too many people, and it got a little overstuffed. But um, I think the overall trajectory of this of this tr- trilogy is kind of like what you said, Steve, similar to, I was going to say, to the original trilogy. A lot of people don't realize this now, but uh, when Return of the Jedi came out, the critics were not too kind to it either. They thought it was corny, and they thought it, you know, uh, it had reduced the characters to cartoons, and all these things that were criticized about that, you know, Ewoks being in it. Uh, people thought that was a, a blatant ploy to sell toys to kids. So this feels a lot like, to me, the reaction to Return of the Jedi, or The Phantom Menace, or even a more recent movie, Solo, which was a movie I really enjoyed, but that I found people, you know, tearing it apart at every turn. So right. um, you, you kind of, you can't please everybody within a fandom that's as diverse as the Star Wars fandom. And I think that it's almost like there's a spectrum. You don't fall into one category or the other, but there's like the category of people who see through Star Wars and think it's dumb. And then there's the category of people that are just kind of under the spell because it's Star Wars. And sure. I think we all fall somewhere on that spectrum. I might lean towards under the spell. But I'm not uncritical, um, and I do see where they kind of missed the boat in certain ways over the course of these recent films. What do you think, Ronald? Um, so I think, I think some of the some of the hardest part about making a movie like this is kind of the idea of. Okay, I'll tell I'll tell you what I think uh, when I think about these movies, man. When I thought about Star Wars before. Well, right after I saw The Force Awakens, I thought there was a lot, a lot, a lot of potential in that one. It was it was incredibly fun. I felt good about it. And I think some of it had to do with the idea that there's like a... You know how HBO is accessible to everybody, but somehow they make it seem like it's this boutique situation in terms of their programming? It's like there's, there's a high-quality version of what you're getting into. The, despite the fact that it's not... It's, it's just as accessible as everything else. It's a premium thing, sure, a premium channel. But there's something about the idea of, like, it's not TV, it's HBO, that sort of thing. At so- oh, totally. At some point, Star Wars stopped doing that for their movies. And I think some of it has to do with the idea of, like, what makes HBO stuff special is that it goes for something, right? It doesn't matter if it works or not. It commits to the idea of, like, if it's going to be a show about, uh, New Orleans and their culture, they go way in. They go way into the cra- culture. They try to commit to the idea, right? And some of what made Star Wars special to me was kind of the originality, the unpredictability, and uh, some of the, like, at the heart of it, it kind of felt like the original trilogy to me felt like and people are saying this about uh, the Mandalorian, kind of a spaghetti Western. There's someone on the left side, someone on the right side, and at some point they have to collide. And the stories are simple enough to follow, don't feel convoluted necessarily. And uh, there's something about simplicity, right? And, and, and these don't feel quite as simple. And some of that has to do with it trying to hit too many sectors at the same time. It trying to please too many people at the same time. And either it has to commit to either being bubblegum 
of being so weird and and Star Warsy that it's doing it, but it didn't seem to commit to either side. And that's something that bothers me. And that's something that as a fan coming in fairly recently, I love the first trilogy. I did. I really did. I, I really enjoyed it. And some of it has to do with the idea that despite the fact that the, the special effects have aged a little bit, it still had this really cool thing with interpersonal relationships, which I think that this newest one kind of succeeded in. But there was something about the connectivity between the characters and how it worked on each side that made it special to me. And I didn't feel quite as connected to any of it. The stakes didn't seem as high. It didn't rest in the stuff enough for me to commit to it. It just, it bothered me. That bothered me. It didn't feel like it hit on anything for long enough for me to care enough. So in the end, when the reveal came, whatever it is, and we'll talk about it later, I was like, what the fuck was that? I just, I hope I didn't go on a crazy rant, but you you know what I'm saying. It's, Are you talking specifically about the reveals and the turns in the new movie, or do you just mean over the course of the trilogy? Over the course of the trip, maybe maybe it felt like the, the two kind of had the things that I loved about the about the Star Wars, the first trilogy, kind of the the relationships, the excitement. It it kind of stayed in each each storyline long enough for me to care about people. Every you know it it just kind of did a bunch of good storytelling and i feel like the second And when you say two you mean the last jedi uh, uh right n- no i'm this talking about the episode eight. no I, uh last year oh yeah yeah that's the name of it yes yes the last jedi two and three of the last trilogy last jedi and what's what's this new one called the rise of skywalker, rise of skywalker. <laughs> there's a problem with these titles if, if they're that hard to keep yes track of. <laughs> okay but there's something about the idea that these two didn't feel like the two and three didn't feel like it was telling the story quite as well didn't commit to telling the story quite as well didn't keep us in these moments for long enough didn't really tell the stakes so much it bothered the fuck out of me man it, it, i didn't feel quite as committed to the second and the third and then when the third came around i was just like uh, okay. I forgot that we got tickets for it. <laughs> I legitimately forgot until maybe an hour before we saw it that we got tickets for it. The second one, I was feeling kind of excited. And then the third one, I was just like, I I could give less of a fuck about it. But it wasn't it. it but we're talking about us. We're talking about even within the world of Star Wars. Still, they aren't terrible movies, but terrible for the Star Wars legacy. Wow. See, I don't feel that way about them at all as far as them being terrible for the legacy that we got the first admittedly very nostalgic installment from J.J. Abrams, who's admittedly a very nostalgic director. Sure, sure. Um, but it had this heart and it had this introduction of these new characters that for me, the chemistry of, of Daisy Ridley, John Boyega and Oscar Isaac and Harrison Ford in that movie is what won the day and what made me feel like there's something going on. There's a, there's a fun element to this because these characters seem to be excited to be in this story. And I think by its nature, The Last Jedi was not going to be as fun as that because it was going to be the difficult middle chapter. But I think what Ryan Johnson did was really subvert a lot of the storytelling that J.J. Abrams was doing that might have been going in an interesting direction, or maybe it wasn't. But I think people who loved how J- Ryan Johnson subverted what J.J. Abrams was doing in the first movie were maybe a little annoyed at the notion of J.J. Abrams coming back to, as they were picturing it, to undo and to fix, quote-unquote, everything that uh, Ryan Johnson did that was interesting. I don't think it was as simple as that, but there is an interesting dialogue between the two directors over the course of the trilogy. What did you make of that, Stephen? Were you happy that J.J. Abrams was coming back? You know, I mean, I, well, so yes, I agree with everything you just said. I mean, that's the answer, is what everything you just said. I, I think that in in a nutshell, the biggest the biggest criticism I have of this trilogy is just an overall lack of vision for what the three films would tell as a singular story. And I think whatever you feel about the the prequel trilogy, you know about episodes one through three, um, I don't think that you could criticize it for not being focused on telling a specific story. And that story was, you know, the story of Anakin Skywalker. And I, I just feel like. Where this film, where this these films, and I guess this this episode nine specifically, kind of suffer from that lack of vision, from that lack of overall just story beat that was going to be you know consistent through the first three or through all three films rather. I just think it it has too much work to you know too much of a load to bear 
to what Disney or JJ or whatever the powers that be like feels they needed to course correct what Ryan Johnson did or because of the reaction to that film, what they wanted to try to like kind of straddle two worlds where they were still kind of exploring some of the themes that he was introducing in The Last Jedi, but kind of trying to bring it back on to this track of nostalgia where, you know, you would hit a lot of the similar beats that we felt. I mean, honestly, like this film, there's so much similarities to like stuff from Return of the Jedi. You know, like there's a lot of themes, a lot of scenes even that are literally literal mirrors to one another. Well, seeing it a second time, I was able to really see that, Steve, in the structure of it, like yeah. how much certain moments echo. And yeah. that's a that's a Star Wars thing is sure. to have things echo. And I don't think that means it's unoriginal. And I think by its nature, Ryan Johnson had the most interesting chunk of story to deal with because he didn't have to wrap anything up and he didn't have to set it up. It's the reason why people love Empire Strikes Back sure. is because you just hit the ground running and you don't have to introduce anything. Um, but I don't think that it, it, I don't think you necessarily have to read it as this level of like confusion and course correction. I know what you just said, Steve, you were saying perhaps there was something on the corporate level, but I think people are talking about it like that was the, the statement that J.J. was making with this movie. But I've read him make so many complimentary statements about what Ryan Johnson did that I really believe he thought he was playing around within the same kind of subversive zone that Ryan Johnson was playing along with and saying, okay, Ryan Johnson said this. Well, how about if I add this? Some of his reveals are not so much doubling back on what Ryan Johnson did and walking back his ideas, but it's like J.J. Abrams was adding on to something that Ryan Johnson did. And I think to me, again, it feels kind of interesting to see two directors who have such different styles uh taking part in this but i can totally see how that made it rather erratic uh from what you were saying ronald about there being no clear thread or no no clear thing to hang it on that's a simple thread i would say the simplest thing you might be able to hang it on is that the acting in these films was pretty much uni uniformly good and that that cast did not sort of um you know, didn't come away scathed the way that, say, Samuel L. Jackson or Ewan McGregor did from the from the original from the prequel trilogy, where they didn't get a chance to act. These 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 actors really got to interact with each other and play a lot of interesting things. And I thought, particularly in the Rise of Skywalker, John Boyega, uh, his charm really worked on me. He really was, you know, he he's a guy who seems like he's really happy to be on an adventure with his with his pals. And I think that goes a long way towards creating that Star Wars feeling that I like. Right, right. But yeah, it, as far as it being a little bit off, I think that goes not just in the reaction but it's in the movies too it's in this new era of franchises where as we've said every little beat is reported as though it's the end of the world we knew so much about the reception to this movie before we ever sat down to watch it and i think that is an interesting uh problem for any movie to have to kind of rise against those uh no pun intended but to rise against those expectations and and meet them i don't know if critics really are fair because they, you know, you you're doing this under a time crunch. You're seeing it. You you know, I, it was it was torn apart in a way that I, despite the problems that I had with it, I didn't feel as strongly about any critics that I read on Rotten Tomatoes, any ones that I read in any of the major publications. I didn't feel as deeply betrayed as <laughs> as some people did, and. Um, I do like some of the things that he, that JJ did in this one, but like I said, I was trying to hit too many sectors, but that may have been why they were the whole implication that some of these characters may go to other trilogies or something like that makes sense. Cause it felt like that's what was happening. It felt like they were closing a chapter, but also being like, Hey, these are some new people. Here's this person with a helmet on that you can't see their face. You can only see their eyes. They might be in another <laughs> thing. You know, it's, it, it just felt very, that felt divisive. It it feels like the way that any any movie that's connected to another movie feels, you know, it feels like you, you at some point, I just want a good story and I don't want to feel like I'm being sold stuff, right? And sometimes Star Wars does a poor job of, I don't want to feel like I'm in a commercial. And sometimes I feel like I'm in a commercial when I'm seeing a Disney branded, Disney produced Star Wars thing. I feel like, oh man, I'm being sold a thing. I feel like I'm being sold more things that lead off to more things. It shouldn't always feel like that. Sometimes you just want to see a good story. 
you know, the, one of the things that J.J. Abrams does really well is this kind of breathless storytelling where he just moves from one sequence to the next. And it's actually very well constructed in a visual way, but maybe from a logic standpoint. You know how the second time you see a movie that's really complex or that that moves really fast, you, you understand all the connective tissue a little bit more and you come away going, nope, it's all there. Right, right. right. I remember the same experience with a movie that I actually think is similar to this in terms of the reaction to it, uh, Age of Ultron. Oh, man. <laughs> I remember the f- the second time I saw Age of Ultron, it made more sense. Like, you know, I'm not saying it fixed all the issues. It's still a big mess. But this movie is a similar kind of different way of being a big mess, but a movie that's trying to please too many people. With Age of Ultron, the problem was that, the you know, Kevin Feige and, and the producers were trying to cram in too much like world building stuff. And Joss Whedon was trying to do a, a, a self-contained story. And that was kind of an uneasy mix. And I think that the, the uneasy mix of the rise of Skywalker is here's a movie that is trying to be its own thing, but it's also perhaps, as we've indicated, you know, a, a studio mandated attempt to fix whatever went wrong with, with the audience reaction or the fan reaction to uh, the last Jedi, which let's, let's remember last Jedi was a huge hit. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, there was no reason for the studio to feel like they failed with it. But when the fandom was that divided, I can imagine that there was some pressure on J.J. Abrams and, and, and Chris Terrio to, to not do that again, you know. But there's no way not to do it. I've seen J.J. in, in interviews even saying, you know, he knew he was going to have half the people loving it and half the people hating it. And he said, they're all right. Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, there's no wrong reaction to it. Um, yeah. And I, I, I guess I believe that. He also said that there's never been any animosity between him and Ryan Johnson, that it would be a lot more interesting if there were, he said, but that actually he was excited to follow up what he did. So maybe if you want to think J.J. Abrams is a little bit of an airhead compared to Ryan Johnson, I don't think that's that unfair. I think J.J. Abrams is a great mimicker of style, and he's a great at keeping things moving, like I said, with that breathless storytelling. But um, I think there's pros and cons to that. And the pros are that you get lots of ideas in there, but the cons are that maybe not all the ideas have time to land. And uh, if you want to give Ryan Johnson credit for having something to say with his Star Wars movie, which I think is fair, we could say that J.J. Abrams, uh, you know, he either doesn't have anything to say or he has 10 things to say at once and he's not really sure what the theme (laughs) is. And so he kind of throws it all out there. I don't think that either guy's approach is wrong for Star Wars. Uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it is, it is almost like fans of The Last Jedi, people who loved that movie and thought it was going in the right direction for Star Wars. They were destined to think this movie was more predictable and more, um, you know, uh, trying to please too many people. But, um, as a person who, like I said, is still somewhat under the spell, I enjoyed the additions we got to the to the world, and I enjoyed the character bits. I like seeing all those actors bounce off of each other, and I thought there were a few moments and scenes that stand up amongst the best from the series. So um, I have no real problems with the rise of Skywalker. But yes, I could nitpick all day the way that it's. D- did you guys get the feeling that the last Jedi almost ended in a way that felt like that could be the end of the whole thing? Um, yes. And then this movie almost had to create a new storyline. And so yes. it was almost like a trilogy or two movies, at least, packed into one. Yep. Maybe if they'd done this as kind of a two-part thing, the way they did uh, Infinity War and Endgame, maybe maybe they would have had people's uh, buy-in a little bit more, because then they could have let some of this stuff breathe a little bit. Yeah, I, just, yeah. I just feel like there's like this... I just feel like I can't help but think that like... I mean, I, I don't want to say this because I don't genuinely feel this, but I, I, I just feel like there's been like a mismanagement or something of what Disney wanted to do with Star Wars. I just think that for all of the trouble, like, you know, whatever degree it was really quote unquote trouble, but like, you know, what what they experienced with, you know, Rogue One, what they experienced with Solo, you know, what happened with uh, Colin Trevorrow, like, being taken off of this episode and J.J. being put back on this episode. It just seemed like they never really either wanted to commit to what each set of filmmakers wanted to do with this trilogy and their, you know, and their singular films if it was going to be, if that's what it was going to be. But, I mean, it just, it's something just feels so weird to me that, like, it's kind of going out with this little bit of a whimper. Like, yes, Last Jedi was a really big success and it was it was it was huge, you'd right? But but The Force Awakens was like mega huge. And you know, this movie just had like has some of the worst like reception of any Star Wars movie and like it's even though it's number 1 at the box office and even though you know, it's like you know, it made 100 and whatever 70 plus million dollars like that that's that's considered a a pretty big loss. Like cuz it's not just another Star Wars movie. Like the the marketing around it even felt very odd to me 
because it did not carry, they did not roll out all the stops, the red carpet, like they do for every Star Wars movie. And the marketing almost made me feel like they didn't feel like this movie was like the epic end of the saga that they were promoting it as. And that's that's really disappointing. And I mean, like, and overall, like I told you, John, I didn't talk to you, Ronald, yet because you hadn't seen it yet. But like, I, I still enjoyed it. I mean, like I have a lot of, you know, you know, I guess issues or like concerns or like, you know, things that I just didn't really respond well to. But like John said, there's some scenes in it that I think are some of my favorite, but there's a lot of stuff that I felt like just was kind of too much in a too little time and, you know, tacked on type things and a little bit of fan service, which I like in doses, but it felt a little too heavy at times. Um, and just this overall feeling that there was like so many story threads that were just like dropped in there that were so just left, left, like abandoned, you know, and some of those coming from Last Jedi, some of those coming all the way back from Force Awakens, and some of those being introduced in this movie. But like, just there was, and that's kind of like a bad, that's kind of a bad takeaway to feel that, you know, this end of your saga has that many kind of loose ends or, you know, and yeah, maybe it goes off into the streaming service or a movie in two or three years, but maybe it doesn't, maybe it just is what it is. And it's like, this is what they were able to do. And hopefully the most amount of people will enjoy it as possible. But I don't know. I just can't shake that feeling that something just feels like there's going to be a, a pretty big shakeup coming up. I, I have a feeling like, you know, the whole star Wars world, whatever happens with it, there's going to be a bit of a shakeup in terms of what they do for feature and, you know, theatrical and, and for the streaming service or whatever else there is going on with it. Um, but I don't know. Well, you know, you know, JJ, when they, when, when they hired him to do the first one, I don't know if it was after the force awakens or if it was before, but he, he wanted them to do one every three years like they did before. And he said he would direct all three. I remember that, and I wish they had done that. And they would have like a they would have a plan. Yes, um, you know, and as much as I love what Ryan Johnson did, I think what JJ was saying was he could work it into his schedule, and that the world would be getting sort of the right amount of Star Wars. It would be an Absolutely. event still. If yep. as much as I would have been annoyed to look at those that schedule and go, oh, my son's <laughs> going to be driving by the time uh, this last one comes out, but. Um, uh, no, I think there's uh, there's something to be said for that. Even though I enjoyed each of these films as they've come out, all, all five of the new ones. I, I also think that that level of oversaturation, if there is something about these movies that is fueled by how special it feels and by being the kind of, I don't think it has to be the biggest uh, blockbuster and the biggest, I mean, I think right now the, uh, the MCU has sort of supplanted Star Wars in the general imagination. Um, and I think that that might even be changing because I, I don't know what they have right after Endgame, as big of an event as that was. I don't know what is next. I think Black Widow looks interesting, but that's not clearly going to be the, sure. the, you know, sure. the biggest blockbuster they've had. So what is the next topping themselves move? We don't know. Maybe it becomes only so... Something you can do only so many times. I've, I've been kind of reluctant to talk about fatigue of any of these franchises because you still get, you know, one a year or one every half a year is still, you know, uh, a decent interval if you really are into it. But as far as people's energy, the general audience's energy and how much they can get excited and amp up about these movies, like you said, Steve, it felt kind of muted going into this release. Um, I don't know. I do think there's something magical about every few years getting a glimpse of this world. Um and, uh, you know, even with the Mandalorian, it's going to be off in a week and we're going to have whatever time we have now to wait for new stuff. Maybe that's good. Maybe it's good for them to go away and make us miss them a little bit and maybe not even to know what the plans are and just be surprised a little bit. I don't know. I don't know what it would take to resuscitate it. Totally agree. Um, it's like, I, I think that that 57 or whatever that uh, Rotten Tomatoes score is, that's a little distorted. That looks to me like you if you were thinking, okay, I'm going to wait, I don't think people should wait necessarily. It's still a movie you, you want to see on the big screen. Well, one thing I was thinking towards the end of the movie was maybe, maybe Disney just bit off more than they can chew. And, and I think the idea is like, I think from a distance, if you see a property and you're like, well, it's like anything else, right? It's like, if you see a situation like, um, when I used to see people on stage, I'd be like, man, this person is not funny. <laughs> I can be funnier than this person. And then I got on stage. And then I realized how hard it was to command a room. And I think that 
<laughs> that's essentially what Star Wars is, man. You're commanding the attention of a culture that's existed way before you will have dreamt of creating a, a world that kind of connected the way that it did. And and then you're you're kind of creating something that, that should feel familiar, but also a new take on it. And I think they bit off more than they can chew. I think the idea that Marvel worked is is a is a combination it's a combination of skill and a bunch of luck. I think once they figured out the blueprint, eventually, yeah, it, yeah, of course, it seems like it was like a seamless thing, right? But something lasting for 10 years and being of quality for most of that time is a small miracle, whether you have the data to back up how to do it or not, whether you have the, the elements to have it work or not. So for them to take on something that w- that has a way more uh, cultural significance than any comic book character in some ways is a little arrogant in a good way. They're like, you know, we're Disney, we can make it work, but I don't think they could do both at the same time. They require a, a certain amount of attention. And I think you can have one or the other, and I don't think they could coexist. That is my theory. <laughs> Not for the same company. I think they can exist at the same time culturally, but I don't think one company can give star Wars the attention and and marvel the same attention and have them be of quality it's it's like managing rihanna and beyonce <laughs> the one manager it's impossible <laughs> i don't think it's possible well now they've got james cameron with avatar as well <laughs> oh god yeah so that's that's my thought that's what i thought as i was watching it i was uh, maybe they bit off more than they can chew and that doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like a loss for us because because Mandalorian makes up for <laughs> some of that too. That's a gorgeous, amazing, fun show that has come out of this kind of cultural shift of Disney picking up uh, Star Wars. But overall, I I didn't hate it, man. But I I felt a little underwhelmed, un, uninspired. I I didn't feel the I didn't feel the stakes the way that I thought that I would have. That's really what I what came out of it. So Steve is an I enjoyed it. You're an I didn't hate it. And I'm an I recognize all the flaws and could talk all day about what they did wrong, but I still kind of loved yeah. it. Um I, I think this all the best Star Wars is simultaneously bold and corny. I think that the difference between corny and cheesy is is that weird line that maybe this new movie has a few moments because of the what we could call fan service or the kind of rushed attempt to get it all in. Maybe there's some moments that drip into cheesy, but but the stuff that's corny fits fine with me. Um, I would also just kind of underline that um, the chemistry of the actors that I was talking about before is really on display in uh, in this movie. And I think that it's full of the kind of heartwarming moments that I liked about uh, Force Awakens. And I will say that, uh, you know, any movie that has a moment where they're charging into battle and, and Finn just leans over and says, you're doing great, buddy, to BB-8 um, <laughs> for no real reason. No real reason, except that John Boyega is happy to be there and BB-8's cute. Um, I love stuff like that. But I think when we get into spoilers, we can talk a little bit more about what actually worked and didn't work about this, about this big mess uh, of a movie. Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds really good. All right, Steve, you ready for spoilers? <laughs> <laughs> Always, man. Always. I, I don't know, what do we want to call the biggest reveal in this movie? I think one of the biggest, and one of the ones that fans of The Last Jedi were, were worried about, was the reveal of the true story of Rey's parentage, mm. which in this movie, she still was the child of nobodies, but her her father was not the child of a nobody. Mm. What did you guys think of the fact that it, it, her last name is Palpatine and she's the granddaughter of the Emperor? I, I, I wish I had some hints that, I mean, I, I wish I had some more hints that there was something like that happening because it felt a little random and... Yeah, I don't know, man. <laughs> I'll let Steve talk about it, and then I'll I'll come back in. Steve, what do you think? I mean, I guess I agree with you. I mean, I just feel like it, it, it goes back to what I said earlier in the show. It really is that I wish that 
that was an obvious commitment for this trilogy. Like that not 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 obvious to the point that they couldn't have a reveal, but obvious to the point that maybe somebody else was pulling the strings like throughout the films and not just like, you know, when when you get out of Last Jedi and you see a commitment on Kylo Ren's part to be the dark side of the force and you know, and, and that's kind of what he's set up as as the end of that film. And to go from that to this and, you know, for him to drop that bomb on her, I don't know, just that, that connection, that's like my biggest thing that I'm going to keep saying. I'm going to bang that drum is just that I just really have a lot of trouble being sold on some of those reveals when I don't feel like, or, or, or more so, I feel that it's obvious that that was not the plan initially. And... I'm all for like, you know, being, being able to, you know, do stuff on the fly and adapt and, you know, do what you need to do to make it work in the best possible way. But I mean, I'm okay with the reveal. I mean, it's fine. I I liked, I mean, some of the, you know, Palpatine stuff in the movie. And I mean, when the movie kicks off with the dead speak, like, it's like, wow, they just, that's it. Like, that's, (laughs) There's no, there's no build to anything about him. It's just there it is. Like that's it. That's where we we're at. And that felt that felt like a pretty big jump to go to that from the end of Last Jedi. Um, uh, but it's fine. I mean, it's fun. You know, like it's it's a it's a it's a it's a recognizable branded name that everyone that's ever been involved with this saga will recognize so i mean you, it does the job of not having to reintroduce some other bad guy if ultimately you want to have kylo ren you know kind of make the turn that he makes in the last 30 minutes of the movie but it also kind of just to me it backtracks on the idea of like building him up to be the real villain of the saga and or at least of this trilogy and and it kind of doubles down on that there actually was a villain of this entire saga and it's always been Palpatine, which that, that works. Right. The idea works. And so it's hard to really find fault with it from a conceptual standpoint to say that if you're trying to wrap up this story and you're going to say it was the story of nine movies, why not say that the guy who was pulling the strings in the Phantom Menace is the guy. But I think the fact that there was no plan at all for this trilogy, we've, we've alluded to it already, but I I find it, it. I find it surprising and edifying. I I don't so much find it to be something that's that different from the original movies. Like the original movies, there were certain things that weren't planned, like Luke and Leia weren't supposed to be siblings. Um, and um, I don't know that Darth Vader was actually originally Luke's father. There were different things that were were planned that got changed along the way. But I think the overall arc was there. And George Lucas, God love him, was the guy who who had some idea of what the story was. So it was in his head. I think that the fact that this was a bit of a back and forth trilogy, it's not so much that it doesn't it doesn't work for me as that I'm surprised they did it that way. Right. And I think that ultimately this movie is the one that has those the like all the symptoms of that problem are evident in this movie the fact that it does have to rush to establish a big bad uh to be the guy pulling the strings because of kylo ren being on a redemption arc you know i did not like the idea of a redemption arc for kylo ren i thought they did a really good job of ending the last jedi saying he has become evil he has chosen the dark side 100 i thought this movie did about as good a job as anybody could have though of making me believe what would make him change back this this shifting power behind him the emperor coming back in seeing the seeing the first order for what it is um feeling the pull of his of his mother and his father's memory i think that like they did a good job of explaining that that would turn him good and and i was so satisfied with the way that they they visually uh depicted him uh being good like the fact that his scar went away and the fact that he was wielding a blaster like his dad would have i thought all of that was so cool that it allows me to kind of step back and go you know I was picturing this third movie where Kylo Ren was finally the balls out villain that that they were building him up to be. I don't know if that's what Ryan Johnson intended. That's certainly how I read that. Um, but I, I certainly think bringing in a new villain to be the main villain of this movie would have been very lopsided and strange. So I think the decision to make it Palpatine, it makes a lot of sense. I thought it was really cool seeing him look like something out of the Evil Dead movies. Um, that stuff was straight up like schlocky horror. Uh, and I thought that was fun to see in the Star Wars world. Um, 
But uh, yeah, it was definitely not being set up by these other movies. And they've said as much. I think that really Snoke was intended to be more than he was. And I still would like to know a little bit more about him. But the idea that he was some kind of genetically engineered puppet, like it works for me to just kind of move on from it. Um, But as far as her being the granddaughter, you know, that doesn't really hurt my feelings too much. I I thought it was cool that she was a nobody uh, when they revealed that in The Last Jedi. Um, And I thought it was kind of interesting to say, well, it's not about who you are, what family you're born into. It's not about the bloodline because she lives in disavowal of of her bloodline, you know? So um, I think that it still kind of sticks to that theme that Ryan Johnson was putting forth that it doesn't matter who you are, but it's not as clear cut as it would have been if she had legitimately been just a nobody out of nowhere. I I did think that had a certain kind of poetic quality to it. but giving her this personal connection with Palpatine that really became the thrust of that final battle, I thought that worked reasonably well as long as they were going to be doing that thing of echoing Return of the Jedi. It was a different spin on, you know, who are these three people standing together in this weird this weird battle. Right. What other reveals uh, really uh, stood out to you guys? I, I, I think there were a couple of uh, scenes that were surprises to me, but I'm trying to think of what were, what were the other big twists in the storyline. Um, I love that there was like a group of stormtroopers living in this area that, that, uh, Finn didn't know about. I thought that was cool, man. Like, I, I wish they would have gone into that a little more. I actually thought that it would end with him going off with that group of defectors yeah. because he, he, that scene where he connected with, was her name Janna? Yeah. Yeah. I think that was her name. That was a really good scene. Her it character was. didn't have much to do after that, but but I thought John Boyega and what's her name Naomi Aki, I think, um, they played that scene really well. There was and even the music, everything about that was a nice moment of like this idea of both stormtroopers realizing they don't want to do what they're being asked to do, and, and her whole battalion putting their weapons down. That's kind of a beautiful story. But also, he was talking about that feeling they have, and the whole movie is hinting at at Finn being a, uh, force sensitive, which I thought that was just an interesting development. And again, I keep saying John Boyega was good in this. I thought he played the emotions of that scene really well. He was excited, you could tell, to meet somebody who knew what his story was like. So I, I was a little bit let down almost that the movie didn't end with him going off with her to sort of join, you know, a tribe that he was maybe had stuff in common with. I, right. I did think it was cool that he was like the co-general of the resistance, but I also would have liked it if, if he had, if all the friends had kind of split up at the end, I would have been, I would have been fine with the kind of, you know, the poignancy of that. That's a heavy thing to introduce in a third Third, third part of the trilogy. I'm like, oh, that's that's like com- that could be a story within itself. I, 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 that was, I don't know. I really like that, but I wish I would have talked about it more. It's just like another. That, that that's like an example of just though these these like just dangling threads. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's it's just. I mean, I don't know. Like overall, you're you're right. Like John. Like I'm just you know when when you see them or I see them and I haven't seen the movie a second time, but like. When you see that 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 note drop, or you hear that that story point come out in the movie, or you see whatever they're trying to do to to, to get it across, you know, my initial reaction was like, "Huh, that's kind of weird." Like that that seems weird to me. But then, like a moment later, you're like, "Whatever, I'm going to just go with it." And you know, this movie is I'm I'm on a ride. It's fun. I, I enjoy it. It's fine. But like, the, the, but then when you leave that moment and you think about it, and like talking with Aaron about it, cause like we went to like the ten o'clock showing that night, so it was like super late. And we're sitting up talking about it, and then your mind detaches from the ride, and you're just like, wait a second, like that's kind of weird, you know? Finn like trying to tell Ray something the whole movie that he still never tells her, and you know, speaking to the idea that he may have some, you know, he may be force sensitive or whatever. Like that's kind of even alluded to in Force Awakens, and that isn't really followed up upon directly in, you know, the following films. It 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 just seems like that's that's a weird thing to me that, you know, you would want him to keep saying that throughout this movie, and for Poe to try to be getting the answer out of him, but then not to get the answer, and you know, I guess maybe you don't need an answer, or maybe that is a maybe that is a a future thing that they're gonna do. But I think things like that, actually, to me, honestly, the, 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 the two performances that really stand out to me are really Daisy Ridley and, and Adam Driver, like in this film. And, you know, as much as I really liked Finn in, a, in The Force Awakens, I actually felt like beyond John Boyega's like charisma and just like his charm as a person and probably an actor, like I don't really feel like he really, I, I personally didn't feel like he really got all of the attention that I thought he was going to get coming out of The Force Awakens. 
And maybe some of that felt like it was maybe redirected to Poe's character, who seemed like a tertiary character to me, but became more prominent where, like, I don't know if that made Finn's role suffer a bit, but I I was really thinking, like, big things were going to happen with that character through this trilogy. And while I guess arguably it did, it just left a lot to be desired for me that I, I just really liked him in that in The Force Awakens uh, quite a bit. And I thought, especially with his involvement in the climax of that film, I thought there was going to be bigger things for him in the films that followed. And I don't know. I just did, I didn't see it. I agree with you about them not seeming to know what to do with those supporting characters. Like, we have the triad. Right. We have the sort of... This is our modern Luke Han and Leia, right. even though it doesn't quite track exactly. But this is our our our, our new trio of characters that we're going to love to see together, and they are great together. Right. I wouldn't take away from the what they do with Ray's character and Kylo's character at all in this movie. I just have been commenting on what John Boyega does in it because I think his sort of, as you said, his likability is so much of what gives me that kind of swashbuckling Star Wars feeling. Sure. As far as like whose movie is this, I think you would you would say Daisy Ridley or or Adam Driver. Yeah. Um, for sure, because they get this, you know, intense stuff to play. But yeah, I don't know what we might have seen if someone had taken the baton of Kylo Ren is now the full on bad guy. Right. Um, they might have still tried to redeem him in the end. I will say this movie does what I would have wanted them to do in terms of redeeming him, which is to involve the legacy of his parents in what turns him. I thought that was a for me, a very successful scene, even though the side of the, the what Leia was doing was very, you know, that's that stitched together stuff with Leia yeah. was was awkward in spots. But the idea that she would sort of, you know, grab the medal that she gave Han at the end of Star Wars, the first one, and and lay down with it and like and and project herself the way we've seen Luke project himself, the way we've seen Ray and and Kylo Ren project themselves. It was cool to see that story point. I think the idea that she unlocked some kind of memory um, and maybe even was projecting that that vision of of Han Solo to to Ben to kind of give him the emotional fuel. But I think the combination of his mom's spirit and and sort of talking with his dad and his memory and kind of reckoning with his remorse, I, I did believe the idea that after that he would see um, you know, see the point in turning to the good side, especially after Ray saved his life when she really didn't have to. So um, I would say that moment was one of the most affecting for me. I, I know I spoke to you in text about it, Steve, that as a guy who misses his dad, um, yeah. when, when, when he hears him say, hey, kid, and he turns around and sees him there, that, was, that, that took my breath away. That moment was so powerful. And I think that moment was only there because they didn't have Carrie Fisher alive to do more as as uh, like, Ben's yeah. mom. But I was glad to see them reckon with the death of Han Solo, because to me, you can't really redeem Kylo Ren without saying, let's not forget he murdered one of our favorites, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, we can't we can't just let him off the hook. Yeah, that, I mean, but that I thought that works, was really powerful. And, and again, I, I think that moment in, in a clearer movie with a straighter narrative, I think people would be talking more about moments like yeah. that and less about the, the, the messy stuff. Well, um, I think... The, the same way that Daniel Craig, I, I liked him as Bond because he was more physical. Kylo Ren is the first guy on screen besides Harrison Ford that I'm like, man, he could beat people up. <laughs> I loved yeah. that feel to him as a villain. Like he gets he gets a lot more physical than any of the other villains or heroes. And there's something about seeing someone who has that mass and is kind of throwing it around the way that he is. I could watch him be a villain forever or a hero for that matter. So I'm hoping that at some point I see him in something else in that capacity. I like the conflict that he goes through. Um, he just, I love the whole emotional thing that started in the force awakens when he's just kind of beating things up, beating, you know, beating the, the buttons up, kicking machines. I just think that him being that conflicted and intense of a person is something that I just hadn't seen in, in that Star Wars world. So, um, I don't know. I, I, I just like anything that he's in, any scene that he's in, I'm watching intensely. So how do you guys feel about the, um, the reveal of Hux as a mole? <laughs> I thought that was so good. I kind of like that, man. Did you? I thought it was funny. I, I kind of wish it could have been more of a story. I think that even Richard E. Grant being there doing the best he could do, I think could have, they could have, again, if this was two movies, they could have really done a lot more with, with all of those ideas. It was neat to see that moment play out, right. but it, it was another thing that suffered, I think from being rushed. Um, 
And, uh, and yeah, you almost forget about it by the time the, the movie's over. But I think Donald Gleason is funny. I think that's part of it is that it's just like, all right, I like seeing him and he played that stuff well, but you could have just as well had him be in the role of Richard E. Grant, um, in the same way that you could have given Rose more to do and not introduce those new characters, even though we liked Jenna and the idea of the kind of tribe of former stormtroopers, if that had been Rose on the mission, it would have made more sense following up the last movie with her being part of the group. Um, I don't know if you guys kind of followed that in the in the reaction. There's a lot of people that were really burned that she was sort of marginalized in this movie um, as opposed yeah. to being featured the no, way she was totally. in The Last Jedi, which I did think was an odd That's choice weird. because especially be, because of the sort of troll thing that happened to her, the sort of, uh, you know, she got run off of social media by really nasty trolls after, after people started coming out and criticizing uh, Rose's character in The Last Jedi, like she was part of what ruined it or her, there was some agenda to, to put her in there. Um, so that was really hateful and nasty. And I, I would just think whoever would be following up that movie would be careful to include her in a way that really makes sense. So um, I thought that was weird to introduce new characters, even have Dom, what's his name, Dominic Monaghan yeah. from Lost and, and Lord of the Rings, having him in as a new character who essentially is standing in every scene that Rose Tico is in and just saying shit that they could have given her as a line, you know, like. Yeah, like, so it's so stupid. And very weird, like just a decision that seems like J.J. Abrams must not be aware of what's happening on social media at all. Maybe he's like Tom Cruise, where he's got people around him that, that don't let him see the, the commentary or something. But that's a problem. Something. I mean, like, <clears> that, that I problem. think that's bad, though. Yeah, no, like, totally. I feel like that's bad to be, you know, like, like, like in a vacuum that you don't understand, like, or I'm not, not saying thing that he doesn't understand, but that it's okay that you would not be aware of that. Like, you, you, I, I feel like these undertakings of films like of this size and impact of, of, of film and of, of fandom of, you know, like, the legacy that it carries, like I feel like that that character Rose was like that actress and that character was much like she was like promoted heavily when Last Jedi came out. Like that was going to be a new character on the level of Finn and Poe, and for that character to kind of be sidelined in this movie after the Last Jedi backlash and after what she experienced on social media, which was completely unacceptable. Yeah, it was horrific and horrible to happen to her. Like that, that seems a bit tone deaf to be like, yeah, it's okay that we'll place Dominic Moynihan, who has a relationship with J.J. Abrams from many, you know, movies and films or series, Lost, whatever. Like, let's just add another character that we can maybe make an action figure for. And, and like you just said, John, like literally, I thought the same thing. She literally is in every scene of most of that guy's in, like standing next to him. And it's just like, why would she not just say that? And why would you need to have another character that literally nobody knows except to say if you recognize him from the Lord of the Rings? And that's really it. And also her reason for not going on the main adventure is like making it her, like they say, come on this adventure with us, Rose. And she's like, no, I've got to stay behind with General Leia. And then there's nothing really that comes of that. And then yeah. they meet a new character that Finn has a relationship with, which again, I liked that scene and I thought that was a really great moment, but they could have totally yeah, had... No. Finn and Rose deepening their relationship that was established in the last movie. And I think it would have made, again, it would have streamlined the movie and it would have made so many people happy uh, to see her have that kind of active participatory role in that yeah, stuff. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that just feels like a misstep. And that's one of the kind of things, like, I also think that the moment um, at the end of the movie where uh, Maz Kanata yeah. or Katana Kanata. Uh, gives uh, Chewie I'm the medal... It's like that moment could have been played so many different ways where it made a little more sense. Like you could have made it a visual, like made it obvious that Leia had that medal earlier and that that's Han's medal. Um, and then have Maz give it to him in a way that didn't feel so offhanded and random. I mean, it still would have felt like fan service, but as far as a moment, it could have been a nice moment, especially because it was established in The Force Awakens yeah. that Maz has a crush for him. On, yeah. on Chewie. She's like, I like that Wookiee. So she could have been much more interesting and much more like... You know, just give Lupita something to play. She's another person who's totally wasted in this movie. However, she was wasted in The Last Jedi as well. So I think that um, sometimes you cast somebody uh, 
I, I think the guys who write Lost referred to it as when you go to the grocery store and you buy a lot of stuff and sometimes you realize you didn't use certain things before the expiration date and now you have to throw them out. <laughs> and I think sometimes when people cast big names in these movies, they that, that does happen. Sure. You know, it happens with MCU stuff sure. as well, where you'll hear some casting that sounds great and then you go, oh, that person didn't get a lot to do. So yeah, not a great use of Lupita or Kelly Marie Tran in this movie, but that moment between her and Chewbacca could have worked better. A uh, friend of the show, Bob Rose, was saying just a, a small medal ceremony um, that mirrors the end of A New Hope would have been better. And yes, I was thinking if they did do that with like in their ad hoc jungle base and like have Poe Dameron handing out the medals like like Leia did or something, that might have been a better moment. You know, it might have felt like a bigger, better way to end it. But either way, you can see that that moment is there because fans know that Chewie didn't get a medal and that we've talked about it forever. Yeah. Um, and the only thing that makes th that moment work for me is that in the, the wide shot of everybody hugging, that's kind of the big final shot of the, the, the whole group, you see that Chewbacca is showing the medal to C-3PO and that C-3PO is like going, oh, wow. <laughs> so that moment made me laugh just the way that all sweetness between these characters makes me laugh. I love that these characters love each other. Um, and I think that's the main thing that carried me through the, the sort of clunky plot developments that we've been talking about. And also I would say like C-3PO, just to mention him, at least they made better use of him than these movies have in about five or six films. Um, I, I didn't like that they reversed their choice. They had this bold choice to sort of erase his memory and have him start over as a new droid. And when he met R2-D2, it was a gag that R2-D2 was able to re-upload his personality in like half a second. Sure. Um, after C-3PO said that, it said that R2-D2's backups were unreliable and that he couldn't do it, you know? Yeah. Um, and so that was funny that R2 was like, nope, gotcha, broop. But it would have been better to end that movie, maybe more poignant, if we ended the movie with a, a C-3PO who had been white, yeah. you know? What did you think about the new robot? I thought that it was great to in, to introduce a sort of like a, a, a rescue pet yeah. that had been mistreated. That, that was really sweet. And did you know that was J.J. Abrams doing the voice? No. Yeah. <laughs> no that's funny. Yeah, when, when he says no thank you and backs up, I mean, that's very much like a dog that's been beaten or something, you know, and he has to, has to learn to like you. <laughs> yeah. No, that was sweet. And I, I did think that, again, that they didn't have a lot to do with him, but the notion of introducing BB-8, who's like a cuter, smaller R2-D2, and then introducing Dio, who's like a pet <laughs> for, for BB-8, I thought that was just, you know, that's just, that's like, that's almost like Baby Yoda or something from The Mandalorian. It's just, let's see how cute we can go let's and, and not break the world. Um, I thought there were maybe a few too many fake out deaths. Oh my God. So many. I mean, that, so that, many that, that's the deaths. problem. Like when Ronald said that earlier, like, you know, you, you have a feeling that like a lack of stakes, which, you know, Force Awakens, like we kind of felt it pretty quickly, like in, in this new trilogy that there were stakes and, you know, a beloved character was killed, you know, and epically and, you know, for what would be a major part of a character's arc. And I think that this film right off the bat like you know within not not right away but pretty early on in the narrative of this movie like you feel like you can feel people looking around in the theater like oh my god did they just kill Chewbacca and it's like within three minutes it's like oh he's alive don't <laughs> don't worry about it he's alive That's so you know true. and then like and then like oh shit she just killed Kylo oh wait never mind she's gonna force heal him he's back you know, like, it's just, I don't know, man. It's just, yeah, I just felt like this, the, the lack of, the lack of stakes in this really kind of hurt me a little bit. Cause I mean, I was, I was like shocked that, that they were going to like kill Chewbacca or that she was going to like take Kylo out on that, on that, like the wreckage of the Death Star, which was an awesome sequence, by the way. But yes, it was, it was amazing. Um, but to think in a moment that Kylo was about to kill her. Without the force spirit projection of Princess Leia to stop him, like she was about to die. And, you know, she then kills him just to heal him, I guess, to show him that she can. And that's the power of the light or whatever. <laughs> but I mean, like that kind of that kind of that kind of logic in the third film of a trilogy to introduce that seems a little weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if you have it featured in this week's episode of The Mandalorian, spoiler alert. That's not enough of an introduction to tell me that that exists in the Force. You beat me to it. I did think that this movie was cool. I, I thought I, it was could, I could I could feel you chomping at that. I could hear you ready to say it, John. But I did think this movie was cool and bold with the ways that 
it's in that Star Wars way. It's simultaneously bold and corny, you know, that you've got this, like this new ways of using the force. I do like that they, they showed things done that we haven't seen done before. I loved when she and Kylo Ren were having a, like a tug of war with that transport that was trying to take loved off it. and it was just going back and forth. Um, even though and that the was the scene the where we lightning. had the sort of fake out. Yeah. Yeah. That was cool. Awesome. You know, the worst thing about the whole fake out Chewie death was that before that scene, we see him leave to go get Ray. It was a weird moment anyway, that they say, Chewie, go get Ray. And then he, the Chewie runs uh, outside and he looks, he's never looked more like an obedient dog <laughs> than in that moment of just like, okay, gotcha. And he goes running out there. But then you see that the Knights of Ren see him and follow him. Yeah. And I felt like we were getting set up for this great hand to hand Chewie versus the Knights of Ren battle, which would have been same, badass. Same. But not only did, did we not get that, we then get the fake out death, which felt very cheap because we, I, I think, I feel like it's one of those things where you can picture moments from the trailer where you saw Chewbacca and you haven't seen that yet. You know, it, it was, it was really not meant to fool us. I don't think. Um, and it was about as cheap as it could be with the sort of explanation of it. But I did like, again, if I liked anything about it, I liked seeing the fact that the characters would react in a serious way to, I mean, it was nice to see them react that way, even if, um, uh, uh, it was, you know, sort of, you knew that he was going to be alive, but I liked seeing, oh, C-3PO and, and the, the three heroes are standing there together, you know, saying how sad it is that Chewbacca's dead. Like that was a cool, that was a cool moment, even if it was in the service of, of, of something that you really weren't like in that moment, you didn't believe that Chewbacca, um, was dead. I didn't anyway, but I did think for a second that Kylo Ren was dead. I did go, oh shit, are they going to kill Kylo Ren in the middle of this movie? That would have blown my right. mind. Exactly. Um, is he dead? As, as, at the end of this movie, yes. Dies, but yes. we're talking about in the okay, middle where, she, where she impales him with the with the lightsaber, oh, yeah. and then she heals him. And i i, I do think I do think showing that healing power on the uh, Mandalorian was cool in, in another sense. We've seen throughout that season that every time that Baby Yoda uses his Force powers, he gets tapped out, and he it kind of was like he's only got so much in him. And I feel like this movie played around with that idea that you have sort of a finite amount of force power and that if you are, for instance, going to use it to bring someone back from the dead, it's going to kill you. I thought that was an interesting development. And I thought that this movie at least played off of that. And I can see how if there is going to be synergy between these Disney Plus shows and the movies, the Marvel and the Star Wars stuff, you can sort of see how that might work now, that they can just introduce ideas in those shows that then become relevant in the movies. But I agree, Steve, it doesn't mean that it's all explained, but I think this movie showed us that, uh, you know, a lot of creative uses of the force, which, which your mileage may vary, but I thought it was cool to see like him reaching through and grabbing things and stuff like that. It was, it was a cool, a cool way to say though, almost, Oh, we can do anything now. <laughs> oh man. I love, I loved when he's fighting the Knights of Ren and like, she like gives him the saber through their like bu that, that little connection that they have like that's that was great that was amazing that was so that was great. amazing and you know other other issues with standing of like how he like looked and was acting once he was like obviously on the good team <laughs> like i feel like his whole demeanor changed when he was like no longer kylo ren like when he's like running up with his blaster and you know kind of just just his physicality even like Without his his uh, Kylo get up, like I just felt like it was such a difference in character, like a decision that it kind of like was weird to me watching some of that. But, um, but it almost felt like I don't. It this is gonna sound weird, but like just the aesthetic of him just like wearing like a shirt and like pants, like looked weird to me when I had this image of like him as this intimidating figure, like he was like stripped down to just being like. A man, yeah. but it, it it looked it looked weird like when he was like coming to quote unquote to her rescue or to at least help her. It was some of those scenes like looked kind of almost corny to me. Like it just they should have had some. I, I feel like there should have been more of a visual like heft to his physique still or just to his presence to still mean like what Ronald said earlier, which is that like he's a big intimidating person even without the Cairo get up. Like, and I didn't really, I don't know. I didn't really get that, but, but yeah, that, that handoff of, of, I guess that that was Luke's saber, uh, was, oh man, was awesome. Was it fucking was. awesome. It was pretty crazy. Who was it that told him he was, she was going to need both of them. Somebody said, you're going to like, Luke maybe said, take this, you'll need it yeah, or Luke, something like that. Luke, Someone knew Luke, that, Luke, that when she, he, when okay. he showed her Leia's saber, like he he gave them the other one to her and took it with her, right? Yeah, 
I'm pretty sure that was Luke that said that because I know someone said that and then I knew she had two sabers. And I have to say, I tracked that a lot more on the second viewing and it was kind of cool to me then um, to picture that that was all sort of, it's one of those, I mean, similar to what we saw in Watchmen um, uh, just recently, that there's these interesting kind of cause and effect things that by sort of telling someone something's going to happen or you're going to need this, you can kind of make something happen. Right. So Luke was able to right. sort of influence the events at the end of the movie by by seemingly seeing at least some glimmer of what what was happening in the future and what might what might need to be done. Something that I kind of took away that I think was kind of cool for at least what they were going for that did kind of make me feel like it was kind of gave me, I guess, like a, the, the finality of like the Skywalker saga, like quote unquote. But I guess if, if this logic tracks, I mean, realistically, like legitimately, the Skywalkers are all dead. You know, that she, in choosing her name, like choosing to be a Skywalker, is more of like choosing the, like, 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 a, almost like an identification of like, that's the family you choose, or that, that's like a Jedi. You know what I mean? Like, that's not a name by blood, but a name by choice. And it's like the Skywalker name has transcended like a lineage and is now something that is on the same level as identifying as a Jedi. And that would, that would be kind of cool if like, that's something that they kind of dive into more with what comes in the future for star Wars. Cause that's kind of like how I felt walking out of the theater when she, when she says that at the end. Um, but I don't know. I thought that was kind of cool. That kind of made it feel a little, that was kind of more of like the final feeling for me. It like into comparing it to Endgame was that like truly like the Luke and Leia and Ben, like all of like the blood of that, of that line, um, either gave it to, you know, either, you know, kind of gave themselves to the force or died, you know, protecting it. And that like this, this character Ray as powerful as she is, you know, was not a Skywalker by blood, but is choosing that name. And, you know, obviously she's a Jedi, but like that, that could supplant that name possibly in the future of that, of the Star Wars world. You know, you know the, the first time through, I thought it would have been much cooler had she just said, oh, I'm just Ray." Sure. But the second time through, I think it's one of those things, you know how research indicates that spoiling things does not, not only does it not hurt someone's enjoyment, it actually can increase your enjoyment of something sometimes. Sometimes knowing something's happening takes away the pressure of wondering what's going to happen. And so whereas you can be like, oh, I hope she doesn't say Skywalker. When you know she says Skywalker, you can pay more attention to the acting and the moment and the and the, the rhythm of the scene and everything. And And the second time through, it played much more to me in a kind of an acceptable, fun way and not as not as cheesy in the sense that like you said she's adopting something she she has a family name that she doesn't want to use right. and she doesn't want to be defined by and so she gets to make a choice what she wants to be defined right. by and seeing their force ghosts kind of standing there i mean it's very corny that they're like yes you can say it <laughs> but but it is kind of cool that she was she was accepted and mentored and loved by both of those people yeah. Um, and, uh, even if it was only after death that Luke warmed up to her, it seems like, um, <laughs> but, uh, it, it adds new relevance to the idea that Leia was very quick to hug her when, when, uh, when Han died and, you know, like, like there's little moments that felt a little bit like, what does Leia see in her? It's interesting to say that she saw in her that she was the granddaughter of Palpatine and knew that she was going to need you know, uh, guidance. Um, I find that to be, even if it is one of those little things that is intended, but didn't really come through in the execution of the movies, that arc of, of her being accepted by the Skywalkers. I I do think that moment plays kind of nicely, even though it is a little vague as to exactly what she's doing there. But as far as the detail of her, you know, this idea that lightsabers are these special things that are only meant to be wielded by an certain people and the idea that you kind of want to hide them because you don't want them falling into the wrong hands. And the fact that she now has her own lightsaber that's clearly built from her staff. Um, or at least that's what it looked like to me. And it's a golden one. And I don't think, I don't think we've seen the golden one before. I just thought all of that was really cool. The fact that she was on Tatooine again, I felt like I was like, this is a neat way to wrap it up. But I was wondering like, why is this scene here? Um, and at second time through it, it was it was much easier for me to accept that that was just a nice little coda to put on the story. And the fact that she's calling herself Skywalker, it didn't seem as forced, no pun intended, um, uh, the second time through. It felt more like, oh yeah, she might say that just as a result of this whole journey she's been on. She might claim that identity. 
And if what you're saying is true, Steve, maybe as people take on this training, they then change their last name to Skywalker or something like that. I don't know. <clears throat> right. I don't know. It might be something cool. That wouldn't be a bad idea at all. Yeah. So, so I want to ask one more thing um, to the real quick conversation and then we can kind of get out of here. But how did you both feel about uh, the kiss? The, the weird ass kiss? Um, well, I think that tells me how you feel about it. <laughs> I, you know, you know, th- there's a one thing I did really like about whenever they interacted with each other. There was some tension, and I think it was, <laughs> I think it was supposed to come across as like kind of it was like an attraction. She was attracted to him, and he was attracted to her, and I, and I think that's been the issue all along, right? But I guess the idea was like, is she related to somebody? Is she, are they brother and sister just because of what happened with, uh, Luke and Leia. So I, I think right. that's why it always felt weird. You know, if we kind of knew in advance that there was not that it wouldn't feel like, man, is he, is he lusting after his sister? <laughs> but when we find out that he isn't and the kiss happens, I, st- I still wish they saw each other more. In, in a non-fighting capacity so that the kiss felt more I don't like the idea that he they tried to kill each other and then the, you know he changed his mind ethically and then she kisses him right after that I feel like that's a little too naive for anybody even if you are armed with you know the force and all that stuff and your trust of people I, I just felt like that that was a weird development but I did enjoy the kiss Overall, I just think that it 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 fell flat because of again the lack of there was something missing in, in that. I I agree in general. I I think overall, I just I, I I was not a I didn't really like the kiss. I didn't like. <laughs> I I just really wish they would have just like hugged or like she hugged him or just she just held him or like like forehead to forehead, just something that's not as intimate as a kiss. Because I because yeah. I don't think that. Like you just said, I don't think outside of fighting one another and their little like four Skype sessions that they had, like I, I don't really. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't like call them Skype sessions. I I don't I don't really I don't think that like Skype walking. Yes, yeah, yeah, Skype walking. I, I don't think that they really like planted enough of an emotional, like intimacy between them beyond their connection that this this their connection to the force, like to their connection to one another, like on a personal level. To really kind of, I I, I, I got to be honest with you. In that moment, I was generally in my genuinely in my seat saying, "Please don't kiss," because I did not. I, I did, did, it was like it's just like this is gonna be one more thing that I can walk away from and be like, I don't like this part of the movie. I wish they hadn't have done that. And I mean, it's fine, whatever. Like I like the sacrifice element of it, but <clears throat> I just, uh, uh, I just wish it would have been a little less intimate. And it like, cause, cause again, I just don't think it, I don't think over the three films, they got to a point where there was any inclination of like that between them, at least for me. I mean, cause anything that I felt that was tying them was like the purpose of like what their connection to each other was through the force and things like that. There was never any interaction, like Ronald said, between them other than when they were fighting. And I, I don't know. So I was, I was just one of those like weird moments to me. You know, I think I was fine with it. I don't know if I needed it. I may have been slightly like, uh, oh, really? When when it happened. But I think as far as giving them that moment before he disappears, I can see why they they thought, you know, in this movie where they clearly tried to pack in maybe 20% too many moments, <laughs> uh, it was one of those moments that they packed in that maybe they didn't... Uh, they didn't totally set up, but I think for a lot of people, these movies have been focused on that kind yeah. of. Uh, they even say, "What is it, R- Raylo?" Yeah, I guess yeah. is the the name. So there's a lot of people that are uh, really interested in seeing that turn into a romance, or have read into it as a romance. And I see where they get it because there has been this kind of tension. Yeah. But I I kind of know what you mean when you really look at their contact with each other and you really look at their exposure to each other. It did feel rather sudden, but I can buy it in the sense of this kind of young love and this kind of you know, Shakespearean kind of conflict where it's like, okay, they have this moment where they can see each other clearly and it's right before he's gone forever. You know, I, I don't mind that from a dramatic standpoint, but did it work? Was the pacing right? I don't know. I don't know if that, right, right. you know, okay. 
I can totally see having a complaint with yet another moment being wedged into this um, yeah. movie. Even though there's a moment that I, th- I feel like we were supposed to get that we didn't get, which is Lando reacting to the state that the Millennium Falcon is in. I thought surely we were going to get like some scene where he says, holy shit, this thing has been treated like crap. Because remember his his like favorite friend, his robot friend, her, her personality was programmed into the Falcon. Right. I, I fully expected something in this to pay off with, with that. Um, but I also kind of half expected the Millennium Falcon to be destroyed in this movie as a symbol of saying goodbye to the past. That's another thing they could have done that would have felt like, oh, shit, you can't go home again. Um, but yeah, pretty much all the characters intact. It, it was a happily ever after. I think they really tried to go back to that feeling we had at the end of Return of the Jedi, where, um, you know, all of our friends are alive and the bad guys seem to be totally vanquished. Right. Yeah, Lando couldn't do that because he was uh, too busy alluding to possibly being that character's father, right? <laughs> Boy, that moment was wedged in. That was one of those moments that you could just leave out entirely and you would never, ever, ever miss it. You know, you d- you wouldn't care. Yeah, like, You didn't oh, need that. It also it, just... it also felt like he was hitting on her at first. <laughs> I know, it's so <laughs> weird. <laughs> All that said, I genuinely can't wait to see this movie again. So that just is a thing. You know what I mean? Like, all the criticisms I can throw throw at it. Like, I walked out still saying, like, I had fun watching that movie. And, you know, here, you know, going on a week later, like, I'm still trying to find a window to be able to go, to go see it again, to, like you did, John, like, to, like, take it in after my expectations can be let go or spoilers are done or whatever, like, just to kind of, like, watch it and let it kind of, like, just kind of wash over me in a different way. But I'm, I'm excited to see it again, and I'm, 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 I'm glad. It was uh, something I got to experience with a crowd who was super into it, and, and as was I in the moment. So it was, it was fun. I want to see it again. I do want to see it again. I'm very curious to see how I'll react the second time. I'm, like I said, I didn't hate it. I just thought that there were parts of it that, I don't know. Something's happening. Uh, it's 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 one of those things, man. It's I guess the idea is like if, if enough people are saying the same thing, I don't know if it's necessarily not true, but I don't know if it, it has to be the dominating conversation um, that, you know, there's something up with it and that it didn't feel quite as special. Right. Um, but it still was, like I said, this is like for Star Wars. We're comparing it against other Star Wars movies, which are still above average films overall, you know? So we're talking about the worst of the best in our, and to, to me out of the trilogy, but that means also better than a lot of other movies that I've seen in the past couple of years. So, um, sure. I just want it to be good. That's all, you know, it's, <laughs> I just want it to, to be good. And I want, I want to be able to show my kids the sh- the movie, you know, when you know, and I have kids <laughs> at some point, and uh, you know, there's there's some pride in the quality that the original trilogy has that I want I wanted to have with this one. You know, that's all. Well, until twenty was it John twenty twenty two or twenty three? The next Star Wars twenty twenty two. It's three years from this this Christmas. So yeah. Well, we got plenty of time to let it sit. Let everybody reset and see what they could do on Disney Plus in the meantime, I guess. Well, there's supposed to be an Obi-Wan show sometime next year, or at least it's in production next year. But I think these shows they've announced but with both Marvel and Star Wars, they're not going to come out at like a rapid clip. They, it yeah. takes a long production yeah. lead time on a Star Wars anything. Sure. So maybe we'll see the Obi-Wan show next year, but maybe we'll just see season two of The Mandalorian. Um there's one episode left in the season at the time that we're recording this. How do you guys feel the Mandalorian stacks up to this recent, you know, you know, in, in the current frame of what Star Wars is doing? Do you think Mandalorian is, is like a good sign of where they can go? I do. Yeah, me too. I love it. I, I think the Mandalorian is such a fun show. Um, I feel like we got a couple filler episodes and even the filler episodes were still fairly entertaining so you know it's beautiful it's well done the soundtrack the score is unbelievable i'm a big fan of it so they're on a good path yeah i I especially like the episodes that have been what we might call the main story the first three and then the the last one were really strong in terms of this world that they've woven together and these characters that we've met along the way um but even the as you said filler episodes had moments and and beats in them that i thought were fun to see with these characters and yeah baby yoda is sort of the the stroke of genius that has made this show kind of water cooler (laughs) material in terms of what people are talking about but i there's something about that character there's there's like a stillness and a calm 
and and, uh, and, a, and you know, I know it's because it's a puppet, but it allows it to, when you, when you see it, it's like, if you've ever been around one of those really calm babies or like a really chill dog who just, you, you, you see it and it's like, you want to know how it does what it does. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Like you yeah. see it and you just want to, it just calms you down. I think there's something cool about the idea that a little baby with the force would have this effect of just whatever he's doing. He looks like he's thinking about it and he's being very carefully considered and it makes the moments where he kind of goes off, uh, funny and weird. Like when he jumps into the cockpit pit and starts hitting buttons and pushing levers and i think he was just <laughs> imitating the mandalorian when he was doing yeah, that definitely. but he also may have been trying to stop this mission i feel like when he was force choking her and when he was trying to re you know maybe he was when he was in the cockpit maybe he was smart enough to know that he didn't like this plan of going to this place um but maybe he's not that smart maybe he's just being a silly baby and doing you know he's just a little baby john he's just a silly little yeah. baby yoda <laughs> but i mean it's amazing that this show which everyone thought was going to be the gritty gunslinger version of star wars which it kind of is that but much more so it's the let's take care of the baby show <clears throat> definitely well all right i think we did it yep boom boom there you boom. go folks ba boom ba boom well, movieshmovie.com, you can find uh, all of our past episodes. Also, facebook.com slash movieshmovie for more regular postings about trailers, anything like that that we're thinking about or talking about. Um, if you have any ideas for any upcoming episodes in the new year, please let us know. And uh, for myself, for John, for Ronald, just want to wish everybody listening to the podcast a happy holiday. And a happy new year. If we don't talk to you, we'll definitely get up with you guys in the new year. Yeah, January is when our uh, our best of episodes. Our next episode will be best television of 2019. And the one after that will be best movies of yeah. 2019. Good stuff. Can't wait. Particularly the best movies is going to be great because we have not talked about a ton of films that have come out uh, in the we second half of the year. So. That's exciting. It's awesome. Yeah. Very excited for that. So you can look forward to that. And uh, yeah, everybody be safe this holiday season. And uh We'll see you in the new year. And as always, you've made our day. Thanks. Bye.